Hi, my name is Alex Coates and I'm a graduate student with the Human Health and Performance Lab at the University of Guelph. So my current research is centered on overtraining in endurance athletes. In an endurance sport, you often hear these terms overtraining or overtraining syndrome, but many people don't know what these terms actually mean. So this video is going to explore what overtraining actually is and how this fits into training and recovery. So overtraining itself is actually just a verb used to describe intensified training. It's similar to using the term overload. Overtraining itself isn't good or bad, it just means to increase the load above what is typical for the athlete. Now, in the current literature, there's thought to be an overtraining spectrum. To begin, we have functional overreaching, which is when training is really hard, often in a training camp setting. Um, the athlete gets really tired and they see a decrease in performance. So the key difference between normal fatigue and functional overreaching is that decrease in performance. Athletes and coaches will likely notice this in workouts when they just can't hit the same times that they are used to hitting. Other symptoms are a decrease in heart rate, can't hit the heart rate zones they are used to, or a decrease in mood states, decrease in lactic acid production, and interestingly, an increase in heart rate recovery. So heart rate recovery is taken one minute post-exercise, and if the athlete's heart drops faster in that one minute, it could be due to functional overreaching. Now, as I said, functional overreaching is a decrease in performance. However, if the athlete takes a week or two of rest, they should bounce back and supercompensate, increasing their fitness. If they don't take that rest, however, and continue to train, they will go into non-functional overreaching. So non-functional overreaching has similar symptoms to functional overreaching. Um, however, because the athlete pushed through and didn't give themselves time to recover, they have dug themselves into a nice hole and will have trouble getting out of it. And by definition, it takes over two weeks and up to a few months to recover from non-functional overreaching. So they will have lost their performance gains by that time. And this is why it is non-functional. It does not make you faster. It does not give you those super compensation benefits. One issue with non-functional overreaching in the endurance community is often that it is mistaken for a lack of fitness. So athletes may take a week or two to recover from functional overreaching, say, but then they continue to train. And because they aren't performing as they are used to, they train harder and harder and are never able to super compensate. Okay, overtraining syndrome is at the far end of the spectrum and it takes months to years to recover from. As such, it is usually the end of the athletic career for an individual, especially because the prolonged health issues do not typically resolve on their own. Overtraining syndrome is removed from training in itself is that in that it is a full breakdown of, horm of hormonal axes and is thought to occur from stressors from many different domains. It is not to be taken lightly and it is important to think of overtraining syndrome as slightly removed from the spectrum. So it doesn't just happen with increased training, it requires those additional stressors. So let's look at overtraining syndrome a little more closely. It is defined as a significant decrement to performance and inability to sustain normal training combined with physical and psychological health problems lasting for months to years. So the athlete cannot train through this. A lack of energy balance, previous or current health issues or gut issues, and stress coming not only from training but from many other areas may lead to overtraining syndrome, although we don't fully understand it at this point. We know it has similar health profiles to chronic fatigue syndrome, which is also currently being researched but is not fully understood either. So it is the prolonged maladaptation of neurochemical, biological, and hormonal axes. Um, unexplained underperformance syndrome is another term that is used interchangeably with overtraining syndrome. It is usually used in the UK, and it's a nice term because instead of putting the blame on the coach or the training, it acknowledges that overtraining syndrome is caused from a variety of factors, and the only thing we truly know is that prolonged and significant decrease in performance. Now, taking a step back, we know what functional overreaching, non-functional overreaching, and overtraining syndrome are. So the most typical form of overtraining is functional overreaching, and this is your training camp or big training block fatigue. And a big question in the literature right now, which is a fun debate, is whether or not functional overreaching is actually functional. So this was brought into light by a study from Ober's group, who had athletes perform the same training camp and separated the groups by those who underperformed at the ends, aka functionally overreached, and those who were tired but didn't underperform, so they called them acutely fatigued. And those are the triangles, AF. And they also had a control group that did three weeks of the regular training. So let's look at this graph. On the y-axis, we have the change in performance from in percentage from before training camp. And then 
On the x-axis, we have time. So before training camp, post training camp, and then T1 to 4 being each week of a month-long recovery block. So as you can see, both the control group in the squares and the fatigue group in the triangles had increases in performance at the end of the block, whereas the functioning overreach group saw a decrease in performance as a definition of functional overreaching. They then all saw some, some super compensation with recovery, but the acutely fatigued group saw the biggest increase. And also not depicted here, the overreach group had a much higher incidence of illness following the camp. So what they found was the athletes who were tired from the camp, but not overtrained or um, functionally overreached, saw the greatest increase in performance with recovery and had less incidence of illness indicating that maybe getting tired but not too tired is usually the best way to go. So it's hard to find that line and more research is definitely necessary, but finding the optimal dose of training for each individual athlete is ideally the goal. So what does this all mean for you, the athlete, the coach, the physiologist, etc.? It Number one, realize that training is the breakdown and recovery is the buildup. So without recovery, you're just getting more and more tired and don't get the benefits from the training. Realize that recovery is essentially the only part of the sport that actually makes the athlete faster. Number two, recognize as we saw with overtraining spectrum that sometimes you need a week to, or two to recover and the athlete will get faster after that and other times they may need more. So understand that pushing through in those instances is certainly not going to make the athlete faster. And finally, changing the glorification of the breakdown and the glorification of the overtraining and now Focusing on the only part of the sport that makes the athlete faster, which is recovery, is where I feel the research should go. Thank you for listening. Here's some references that you can check out on your own time. And also check out our website where you can see more videos and see what the lab is up to. Thanks so much for watching.